Ladies and gentlemen, we got a great interview for everyone today. We got John Wilson on the podcast. Well, if you didn't know what the show was called, you still don't know. And it's a whole new ball game. That's right. Podcast. So thank you, Alex, for introducing the show in a different yep. way today. But what he did stay consistent with is calling this interview great. So there's just some consistencies in life that won't go away. And I'm here for it. You know, I'm in a nice routine now. I know what you're going to say when you start off the show. You threw me off a little bit with that, ladies and gentlemen. But, you know, I'm happy with it. That's right. And then I'm Alex Fuse, and that's Vinny Pasquatino, just to make sure we get the names in there. But as Vinny said last time, if you don't know by now, what are you doing with your life? Yeah, that's right. What are you doing by not listening us, listening to us talk? Just, twice a week. Twice yeah. a week. That's right. I just don't know what you could possibly be doing better that isn't listening to us ramble on and on. Mm -hmm. More so you than me rambling. Yeah, you know what I want to get better at as I've, and I feel like I'm doing a better job is I feel like a lot of time on podcasts or talk shows or whatever, the host will ask a question. And then as they ask the question, they keep expanding on the question. So instead of just asking the cut and dry question, it's all right for, oh, Bear is messing with the keyboard there. Um, instead of just asking the question, you'll ask and say, you know, how are you feeling like, and then, you know, you could be feeling this way because of this, or you could be feeling this way. So, you know, long story short, how do you feel? Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, you could have just said, how are you feeling? Everybody knows what just happened to that person, you know? And that's something I want to get better at just asking the question and not expanding too much. Like for instance, I've asked before, you know, about scouting reports or something like that. And then I'll compare it to myself. Nobody cares about me. You know, we're asking the guest. It's not about what I'm doing. So that's what I want to get better at. That is my, podcast resolution for the week hey Vinny can you talk about what it's like getting ready for spring training for a second yeah see I don't understand why the talk about question is so bad because you're getting people to expand on something right like I get well, I get it you don't want to you want to lead them in a direction and not just be so broad with a specific right. thing. but no like talk about spring training versus how are you preparing for spring training Talk about preparing for a spring training. Well, what do you want me to talk about? I mean, yeah, sure. You mean? I get the point. Are you actually asking me or are well, you like, giving I was, an example? No, like I, well, I was interested, but like I used it kind of because you someone used messaged me. Cheap to try to make fun of me because the last two. But no, because someone texted me and they're like, they also didn't understand. Like, why? It's kind of like, I get the point. Like I, I understand why it's, right. but I don't, I don't see why it receives so much hate. That's that's. I get why it wouldn't be considered a great thing to say because you want somebody to expand on something, not just talk about it, and mm -hmm. you want to be specific with your question because you don't get to ask that many questions. Um, but I don't think it's the worst question in the world. That's true. Or the worst <laughs> phrase in the world to yeah. use. I don't disagree with that, but that's just what I've been taught. I don't know. Is it right yeah. or wrong? It's up to it's up to you to decide, I guess. Who knows? Who knows at this point? Exactly. But overall, obviously you do a great job and you know that. So um, you know, I, I like I said, I know I, I use different words. I try to use different words when describing interviews, but this was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. I agree. I had a good time with John. It was cool interviewing a sweet mate, a former sweet mate of mine. He won't be the last Old Dominion alum that we get on the show. Actually, here in a few weeks, we're going to have a current Old Dominion player as we preview the Old Dominion season. So as we get closer mm -hmm. to the college baseball season and potentially the college softball season, too, we're going to get people on that are actually playing at those levels um, mm -hmm. to talk about it, which I think will be pretty cool. A nice little hype up because that's what normally people go on podcasts for anyway, is they have something that they want to talk about, which, you know, promoting a book, promoting a movie, whatever, not with us because we're just promoting baseball players. But, you know, the season is coming up and we're pumped for it. That's right. I guess we're always promoting uh, the sport, right? Like that's what this is. It brings awareness to just how great this sport is. At some point in every show, we talk about baseball. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I agree. But 
without further ado, as Vinny always loves when I say that phrase, here is a pitcher in the Twins organization, John Wilson. John Wilson, welcome to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, there he is. He's sort of in the flesh. We can see his face. He's got his AirPods on. John, how are we doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Hey, I can't complain. You know, I'm just out here living. I'm just living life uh, to the fullest out here right now. So you're down in Florida. To explain to everybody, you're down in Florida at um, the Eric Cressy Institute, essentially. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it has a more formal name than that, but that is what I'll call it right now. So you're down there right now. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yep. So I'm down here at uh, Cressy Sports Performance. That's the official name. And um, I spent two summers. She's got two facilities, one in Massachusetts and one down here in Jupiter, Florida. Um, so I went up there in Massachusetts to do my Tommy John rehab in 2018. Spent the summer up there and then had a great time. Um, really, um, they really helped me out with my rehab, getting my shoulder right, getting my elbow right, stuff like that. So I went up for the next summer in 2019 also. I was hoping to be able to play, but I wasn't ready to play yet. So I figured I would go back up and train and figured once I, once I signed, I was going to get away from the cold weather for a little bit. So I decided to come down here for two months, spend uh, all of December and all of January down here. So now can you explain? So like, I don't, I'm not too familiar with um, who John Cressy is. So could you explain to the baseball Eric fans, Cressy. Eric Cressy. Eric, yeah, sorry. Wilson. His name is Eric Cressy. <laughs> okay, so. Can you explain uh, who Eric Cressy is? Yeah, so a lot of the time, like, I'll get that. Um, I'll tell people, like, I'm training at Cressy Sports Performance. They're like, oh, who's that? I'm like, Eric Cressy. They're like, who's that? And I'm like, well, he's a big trainer. He's got a couple guys uh, that you may have heard of before. Um, Noah Syndergaard, Corey Kluber, Justin Verlander. Uh, Brad Hand. Um, I mean, the list goes on. Like, it's it's a pretty impressive group of guys that are in the gym. And so most of the pro guys in the offseason will come down here, come down to Florida rather than go up to Massachusetts and deal with the weather up there. Um, and so I work out at 8.30 every morning, and that's usually when a lot of the big leaguers work out. So I'm able to be in the gym with guys like Michael Waka, uh, Jesus Luzardo, um, Jimmy Nelson, all these big leaguers, like big name guys, and and then you, that's, yeah, and then me. And then, that was a good um, <laughs> job, by the way, John. That was a great job. That's a good plug for the show um, that we can just drop those names in here. I uh, appreciate it. And um, so, really, just kind of being in that environment with those guys around, you know, looking around the room, and seeing Noah Syndergaard and all these guys that are at the level that you're trying to get to right now, it kind of pushes you. <clears throat> to push yourself like every day when you get there. So um, it's a pretty cool environment. Is there any difference between the Massachusetts facility and the Florida facility other than the weather? The Massachusetts facility is a little bit bigger uh, in terms of square footage, but the Florida facility has uh, a big open turf field outside the facility. And then there's a couple like actual full size fields that we can go throw on too. Massachusetts, you got to either throw in the parking lot or in the net. Now, uh, down there, is it only pitchers? Like, we know that he's a, a big PT guy and helps with all of that, but is it only pitchers or do some hitters go down there too? Now, there's, a, there's a bunch of hitters too. So they actually have a really, um, a really nice uh, covered uh, facility right next to the, the gym, and they have uh, about four cages in there, and then they got three bullpen mounds. And so they got – like hitting groups every day. They got their own hitting guy, a couple pitching coaches. They got um, some bunch of technology, the hit tracks um, that the hitters can work on stuff out there. And then they'll do some ground ball stuff on the turf, on the field sometimes. Like they have a uh, contract with the city of Palm Beach that allows them to use those fields. So they actually just had their pro day out there yesterday. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty cool setup down here. So what have you learned – the most from when you work out with guys like the, the pitchers you name, you know, what have you learned the most, especially maybe this off season? I think it's just kind of how you go about your business and being like a true professional. Um, that's kind of one of the things that I'm mm. 
looking to continue to improve in my own routines. Um, and so watching these guys go about their business, you know, I don't know if you know Jimmy Nelson, who's a pitcher with the Brewers a few years ago. He's with the Dodgers now. He's in the gym at about 8 o'clock every morning, and he's still working out when I leave at like 12, 12.30. So I don't know what the guy does, but he's he's just always working, always doing stuff. And he goes through about five shirts a day. It's, it's pretty impressive. But watching him go about his business um, and the way that he carries himself and holds himself up to a high standard, and not only himself but other guys in the gym as well, like somebody – banged out their cleats in the gym one day and there was a big pile of dirt and he was not happy. So he's kind of like the dad of the gym. He's a little older guy, um, kind of keeps some of the other guys in line. And um, so I'd say that's probably the biggest thing, kind of carrying yourself in a professional way and going about your business and getting your work in. <laughs> um, so John, you went to Old Dominion. You are from New Jersey. You are a big pork roll guy. Huge. So in high school, you went to North Hunterton, correct? Correct. So you went to North Hunterton. You committed to Old Dominion right before senior year, yep. right? Right at the start. And right at the start of senior year. You went on to have an unreal senior year in high school. You got drafted by the Reds. You chose to still go to college. But when it came to recruiting, what made you really choose Old Dominion over any other school that you could have potentially gone to? I think the biggest thing it came down to was, one, the weather, and two, the conference. So the weather, I didn't want to go north. Um, it came down to it was ODU and Bryant up in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. so Bryant was a little closer to home, but playing the colder weather didn't really appeal to me too much. And – Neither did the conference. The conference, the NEC wasn't as competitive as Conference USA. Um, I think our senior year of high school, 2016, Conference USA was ranked fifth in the country RPI-wise. Um, and then when we were there, it was probably seven or eight around there. So traveling down south, you know, playing in Conference USA, it's April, and you're down in Florida or Texas, or you're able to play at home in February. Um, Whereas opposed to if you go north, you basically spend the first month of the season on the road. Um, and that can get tough, especially when you're trying to keep up with classes and stuff like that, too. So, and then not to mention the um, relationship that I was able to build with the coaches at ODU. Um, I think that was the, kind of the biggest thing that stood out to me and mm -hmm. what made me choose them. So, yeah, I think it's interesting because a lot of people from the South, I don't think, think about the weather that much when it comes to choosing a college school. But, I mean, if you look at the College Road Series, I mean, Michigan's the anomaly. You don't see many Northern teams nowadays making it too far because like, I remember when we played Iowa our sophomore year, they were saying they hadn't really been outside at all. Like You can't right. mean up North at all because the weather is so bad and they, they, the season starts in February. It's still not warm enough for you to train. So kind of coming to Virginia where the weather's still not great, but it's, you know, it's better. What were you able to learn at Old Dominion that, you know, you're still taking with you now? Um, I think a lot of it was kind of, again, like the way I go about my business and kind of coming up with like a routine and finding out what works for me. Because freshman year um, – I had a lot of maturing to do, um, safe to say. And I would just kind of do my thing and kind of do it to the bare minimum. I mean, I worked hard, but I don't think I realized like, what actual hard work was until I had my surgery and I had to try and like kind of come back from that. Um, so I'd say the biggest thing was kind of finding like my routine, um, really finding like what works for me and stuff along those lines. Yeah. So you, you have an unreal beginning of your freshman year. You get hurt, what, three quarters of the way through the year. You have Tommy John, you miss your sophomore year, you miss your junior year. And how were you able to, you know, persevere through all that? You really didn't play that much in college, which I think speaks to how good you were is that, you know, you still got, 
you know, you still signed after not having too much inning time on the mound through college. So kind of what were you able to – how were you able to get through that? Honestly, I think one of the, like, biggest parts of it was the fact that I got to hit uh, junior year. And um, because sophomore year, you know, I spent that whole offseason trying to rehab so I didn't have to have surgery, but um, ended up not working out that way. And I had my surgery a month into the season. So that was kind of like heartbreaking for me, especially with how, how that year went because we won 15 games. So, and knowing that we had one solid weekend starter and if we win 15 games, but we have one other week, like solid weekend starter, that's a completely different season because then we're in every single series. So being on the sideline that whole year and just watching kind of the season play out the way that it did and not being able to contribute in any way, like hurt a lot. And um, so that year was tough for me. But then <clears throat> junior year came around, and same thing. I was hoping to be able to be ready for the season at some point at least, but didn't work out that way. And then in about March, Finney came to me, and he was like, hey, I want you to start swinging the bat again. Like, we need another lefty bat off the bench. I was like, okay. Like, heck yeah, let's do it. And <clears throat> so I started going in the cage every single day with Sean Wood, and we would go hit together every day just for 20 minutes, 10 minutes sometimes, like 30 minutes. But he was giving me drills. We were working on stuff. And it was good to kind of, like, clear my mind and, like, get away from, oh, man, like, my arm, like, it's not healthy yet, whatever. Because that was just kind of, like, bringing me down a lot. And so to be able to – and especially something that I haven't hit in, like, three years, so I wasn't very good at it again. So I had to, like, make myself good at it again, basically. Um, so it was kind of like a competition within myself. Yeah. Like, All right. It's so interesting. You kind of came in as a two way, as a two way, uh, yeah. <laughs> the quotations to, you know, make you a little bit more excited about the fall when you know that you're just going to be a pitcher, you're fresh. Yeah. You end up being the Sunday starter. You get hurt. You miss your sophomore year, junior year, you come back, you hit, you essentially win us a game against VCU by <laughs> walking against essentially an all American well, I'm not going to say that one at that wins a game, John. So <laughs> that's not what we're going to get into right now. You were the last hitter to hit. But you ended up winning the game. So, John, I, I agree with you on that. I agree. I with appreciate you. it. <laughs> so you have that. You come back your senior year. You're able to start throwing. You're throwing sort of in relief in the midweek, I believe. And then over the summer, you go up. This is the summer of 2020. You go up to the Northwoods sort of quad, you know, pod league that they have. Yeah. And you throw, I believe, 27 scoreless innings, and then you go on to sign. How was that experience kind of getting your mojo, your confidence back this past summer? Yeah, well, honestly, it started in the spring when I – like, my first outing against VCU, uh, I threw pretty well. Then I threw against VMI. Um, you know, I, I threw fine, not my best, but I was still getting out there, getting used to throwing again against hitters. And then I, I got a start. It was my first start of the year against Norfolk State. It was my first time, my first start since I got hurt in 2017. And that was the game when I finally felt like myself again. Like my velo was kind of back to normal. Um, and I, th I was able to throw five innings. I think I threw five scoreless innings. And then we ended up – we had a, had a, like an hour and a half rain delay and ended up losing. Um, but then, of course, two days later, our season gets canceled. So I was, like, just starting to get back to myself, starting to get that confidence back. We get shut down, so I got to take a couple months off and then go up to North Dakota. And I'm like, oh, man, like, I wasn't able to just kind of, like, pick up right where I left off, or I wasn't – I didn't think so. And then um, – because I didn't even pitch the first two weeks I was out there. I was still kind of ramping up. So I didn't want to just go up and, you know, try and ramp myself up too quickly just to go out there and pitch and – Get, end up getting hurt again so we took it a little slow so it took a couple weeks uh threw a couple of bullpens and i think my first appearance was out of the bullpen and i came in through like four innings um i think i maybe gave up like one hit and then i was like okay like i can still do this even if i was thrown out of the bullpen which is something i had never done before um so kind of like i got one outing under my belt out there 
got another routing under my belt. And I was like, all right, like I got my mojo back. You know, I'm kind of, I haven't really lost a step. So what are the, you know, you know that I've dealt with an injury too, but yours was definitely on a bigger scale. What are the nerves like when you haven't thrown in three years and then all of a sudden, you know, in Richmond, Virginia at BCU, back in there out of the bullpen, which is not something that you're necessarily comfortable doing. Well, yeah. what are the emotions like when you're running out to the mound and then you finally tow the mound? It was weird. It's not like – because when I, when I have a start, like I know my routine and my times, like how long it takes me to get ready, stuff like that. So, like, I'll throw in my music before the game – and I got, like, that routine set down. So then, I'm, like, I'm locked in once the game starts. So coming out of the bullpen is a little different because you never know what's going to happen. Like, I was told I was going to come in in the third inning, and I don't think I ended up coming in until, like, the sixth. So I was kind of, like, trying not to be ready too early because I don't want to be, like, completely mentally locked in and then sit around for a while and, like, lose that focus and then have to try and get focused again. So I was just kind of, like – trying to stay loose in the bullpen, like keep it light. And um, so it, it was definitely different trying to prepare for that. And I almost tripped coming out of the bullpen. So you had to jump over the gate. I almost fell and face planted. Um, it was like I had butterflies running out there. Like I don't even remember the last time I felt like that. Kind of maybe my freshman debut. Um but it was it was definitely like a lot of emotions, but it was something that I had been kind of dreaming about, honestly, for the past three years and literally envisioning in my head every single night, like that exact moment. So it was pretty cool. When do you know as a pitcher if you have it or you don't that night? Uh, it's tough to say. Honestly, like I would say in the bullpen, but a lot of my best games have been when I threw my worst bullpen before the game. And then vice versa. Um, like, I remember against Middle Tennessee in my freshman year, I was lights out in my bullpen. Like, one of the best bullpens I've ever thrown. And then I go out and give up five runs in the first inning and get yanked. So, it's like, I almost – I don't want to feel, like, amazing in the bullpen before the game. Like, I, I want there to be, like, a little – some kinks here and there or whatever, and then I'm good to go. So. So, you're a very ritualistic person. Yep. I know this because I had to deal with it for three years. <laughs> But take us through, and if there's any secrets in there, don't tell us because I don't want you to give away your craft or whatever. But take us through, if you're pitching on a Friday night, what does your Friday look like? You know, from the time you wake up, is everything kind of planned out for you, um, kind of how you want it? So, again, like this year was a little different because, um, well, I only started one game. Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying. I'm just saying in general, like. Um, right. So, um, you usually, just wake up, eat breakfast. Um, nothing too crazy. Like freshman year, we were playing at one o'clock on every Sunday, so like, I wasn't. I didn't have to sit around and wait all day. So John was nice. known as uh, Sunday John. He, he yep. threw every Sunday. We had normally we were really good that year, so we had a lot of arms that hadn't thrown yet. So John was always told on Saturday afternoon, normally after a win, that we had plenty of bullets in the bullpen. So if he didn't have it that day, he was coming out of the game quick. So John always had the pressure the pressure on to pitch well that day. Uh, lots of bullets. Lots, lots of bullets, bullets in that bullpen. <laughs> um, yeah, but <laughs> – so that was the nice thing about freshman year, especially like I didn't have to sit around all day. I could just go downstairs, eat, go straight to the field. Mm -hmm. But usually my routine, like I'll get to the field uh, around during BP, go up to the training room. I like to do some electric stim before the game. Um, so I go up there, throw in some music for a little bit, nothing too crazy yet, just kind of relax and, um, and then do that stim for about 20, 25 minutes, go back down to the field, um, hang out for a little bit, and then I'll start to get dressed. And about an hour and 10 minutes before first pitch, I'll start rolling out, roll out for about 10, 15 minutes. And I'll start going through my dynamic warm up, which takes about 10, 15. And then I'll do my static stretching, um, bands. And then now I do, I'll do plyos now. So I'll work in some more time for those. Um, and then. I get ready to go, go out, do my long toss. And now it's nice to have a routine and everything. 
Um, but the one issue with routines is if something gets thrown off, right? So what happens if your routine in any way, whether it be weather or something else happens, what do you do to make sure that you're still locked in for a game? I just kind of try and like not stay, like I was saying before, like not stay too locked in. Cause mm-hmm. if you're too locked in for like, you can only be that locked in for a certain amount of time. And if you like try and do that, like when you're not competing, like it's just going to be like wasting energy. So I'll try and like, this happened my senior year of high school. Uh, it was a state semifinal game. We had a rain delay. And I think I had already started throwing in the bullpen right before the game started. So I kind of had to like stop, go to the dugout, kind of like get myself to relax a little bit rather than being like in that focused mindset. Like obviously, you know how I get on game days. Um, So I had to relax myself a little bit. And then as soon as they say, hey, we're good, like 20 minutes, whatever, it's like lock it back in like that. Um, So I think that's kind of really important, especially if something does get thrown off for your routine like being able to flip that switch. Mm -hmm. What kind of music are you listening to? Because I know some guys like to listen to the, like the rap that gets you more pumped up, but some people, some pitchers like to listen to the more calming jazz music to relax you. So what do you like to listen to on game day? Uh, I like to listen to some, like, I wouldn't say like heavy metal, but like, I like skillet, you know, stuff like that. Um, you know, that, that that kind of music, it'll get you going before a game, get you locked in. So, John, you have one of the more hmm, legendary study hall to baseball stories. So <laughs> I would really like you to tell that story if you're okay with that. Now that we're a few years removed from you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so this was freshman year, and this is – partially where I got the nickname Sunday John because the only day of the week I had everything figured out was on Sundays when I would show up to the field and pitch. And the guy was gross on Sundays too. Like he, <laughs> he just car, he throws the invisible ball and nobody could hit it. Yep. Um, go ahead. So I think I didn't finish my study hall hours for the week. Um, as freshman year, did you have study hall hours in the spring? I had study hall. I did not have study hall in the spring. No. Okay. So, okay. So we were, it was mandatory in the fall. But if you got good enough grades, then you were you didn't have to do it in the spring. Well, I messed up freshman summer in my <laughs> two classes. So I was in study hall full time. We had two so, classes over the summer. We had two classes over the summer and John failed one. All we had to do was go to school <laughs> and he failed a class. Yeah. So we're not gonna talk about that. That's past us. I have a three point oh GPA now, by the way. And I'm about to graduate. So Congratulations, my friend. Thank you. I never thought anyway, we'd get this day. I know, neither did I. Um, shout out to Meredith. Yeah. But um, so I didn't fin- – I think I had like six study hall hours a week, and I didn't get all of them in. I think I was like an hour short. And so the, there was a punishment if you missed your study hall hours. And the punishment for me was I had to go sit up in study hall during the entire practice. And the, the best part about our study hall at Old Dominion is it's in left field. You can see the field. Yeah. From study hall. It's the only yeah. field that you could see while you're in study hall, and John just had to sit there while we practiced. Yep. So that wasn't fun. I was up there for about four hours just sitting there by myself. And the next day at practice, our coach asked me, he's like, we had our team meeting right before practice, and he asked me, he's like, how was study hall yesterday? And I was like, oh, I was pretty good. Got a lot of work done. <laughs> he was yeah, like, I told our coach in <laughs> study hall when we were at practice. Uh, <laughs> I, and this was in front of the whole team, too. The whole team. Like, and everybody's just looking at him like, what? <laughs> and he was like, oh, really? He's like, you want to go back up there? I was like, no. He's like, so how was it? I was like, it was bad. It was terrible. <laughs> Yeah, I got I got a lot of a lot of crap for that one. I think that's one of my favorite stories um, <laughs> from college. Just that moment right there. Yeah, we still talk about that one today. Yeah. What did you learn most from uh, sitting in study hall, John? Um, that I'm not gonna be short study hall hours again. <laughs> I was gonna get all my study hall hours in the rest yeah. of the year. So, John, you are the son of a scout. So what were you able to learn from your dad? Your dad, John Wilson, also, you're the second. 
I'm right? the fourth. You're the fourth. Sorry. You're the, the fourth. fourth. And so, okay, your dad's a scout. What were you able to learn from your dad, whether that be about, you know, what is a scoutable tool that I have or whatever? What did you learn from your dad that you really took to heart on what you need to do to become a professional baseball player? Well, pretty much everything. Um, he's taught me pretty much everything about the game. And he's, you know, being a scout, he's also a scout for the Twins. So that was pretty cool. Um, you know, growing up a Twins fan, uh, when the Twins called me and offered me the opportunity to sign, it was going to be pretty hard to turn that down. So, um, but my dad's given me a lot of, like, really cool opportunities and experiences. Like, when I was eight years old, I went down to the Dominican with him twice uh, when I was eight, and then I went again when I was in seventh grade. And going down there, especially at that young of an age, was kind of like a culture shock. I haven't, was never exposed to anything like that before. So you go down there and there's kids at the, at the facility around my age and they're doing the players laundry and scrubbing cleats just for meals. And I was like, I would sneak into the kitchen, like steal a banana and give it to them. These kids were like treating me like I was like a king. Like they're like, thank you. Thank you. Stuff like that. And so like the, the fact that my dad was able to give me those experiences, like really helped me like kind of like shape my perspective and you know, you can't take anything for granted, especially in this game. Um, but yeah, it's like we would go out, we would go out and play catch every day. And he was the one who taught me how to pitch. And the one thing he always said to me was, learn how to pitch, like when you're young. And if you're blessed to throw 90 miles an hour, you'll be a millionaire. Because a lot of the times it's like the opposite for kids. Like they learn how to throw hard first, or the velo comes naturally, stuff like that. But they don't know how to pitch. So like the one thing my dad taught me was learn how to pitch, you know, in, out, up, down, moving the ball around, stuff like that. And that's the reason I'm playing professional baseball now um, because I don't throw very hard, but I know how to pitch. So it kind of is able to offset it a little bit, if you know what I mean. What's one pitch you've always wanted to learn how to throw? Oh, man. Um, I think a knuckleball would be pretty cool. A knuckleball. A uh, okay, so John, uh, this is for Abby. Abby is John's girlfriend. Um, what is going to come first? You're a big dog guy, so we know that. Everybody knows that. Bear the dog yep. is here somewhere. Bear is one of, you know, you're tight with Bear. What's going to come first, John? A dog or a ring? What do you think? Um, I'd have to say a dog. I know she's not going to be too happy about that, but probably a dog, yeah. Okay, good answer. Clip that, Alex. <laughs> I think that's a uh, different at any department. <laughs> I just had to ask, you know, that's what the people want to know. <laughs> I want to, like, I, I, I want to ask a follow up. But, um, uh, so you're wearing a pitching ninja shirt right now. I am. Is he, like, your ultimate, like, favorite follow on Twitter? Besides me? I would say so. Um, yeah, he's got that Dropbox pinned at the top of his Twitter. And so you can go in there. I don't know if you've ever clicked on it before, but you can go in there. And he has all these different folders of different players. So you can go through and click on, like, Clayton Kershaw. And it'll go through everything he, he's posted on Clayton Kershaw. So it's, like, grips. Um, he's got, like, quotes, stuff like that, like, slow-mo videos. Like, it's pretty cool. And – so honestly, whenever I'm bored, like I'll just go look at his Twitter, go watch some stuff, and learn some stuff on there. And it's pretty cool. Like you hear these stories about some big leaguers that literally learned grips off of Pitching Ninja. It is insane. It, that's insane when it comes to technology and kind of how people use it. Like that's one of the craziest ways to me is, oh, this guy throws his slider like this. Now nah, I'm going to do it. Yeah. No, I think I think it was Jake Diekman this year. Saw a video of I forget who it was. was it Adamino, um, right? Was it Adovino or was it Chaz Rowe? Maybe. I'm not sure. I think it might have been Chaz Rowe. He saw pitching him to post a video of his slider. And Diekman replied and asked him for the grip. And pitching him replied, sent him the grip. And Diekman threw it like three days later in their game and punched out like a bunch of dudes with it. So, Same. yeah. Yeah. So Definitely my favorite follow, I would say. So let's say you're facing Vinny. How would you pitch 
to Vinny. Bust him in. Oh, oh come on in there. Come on yep. in there. Yep, dust him off the plate a little bit. Come on. I will say – get those, get those arms extended. John and I have faced one time, I think, and he walked me. Uh, no, 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 no. We faced a couple times. I, I don't think I ever walked you. You walked You grounded out. You might have popped up. No. You grounded out. You hit a hard ground out to second base. I know that for sure. I don't remember any of this. He, just... he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't have a hit off me. I know that. I think um, that's true. I will admit that that is true because I think that we've only faced once and I got walked, so I didn't have anything to hit. I have a video of it. I also have a video of me of you swinging and missing at a curveball. That's fine. Hey, I'm just baiting you, setting you up for the next pitch. That's, uh, that's all I'm doing. John. Me and Vinny had a little rivalry um, our freshman year because we didn't. We were the only two that didn't face each other in the fall, mm-hmm. and we. That's because Coach uh, Finley wanted to keep John's confidence high. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he had said that something to me about it at the end of the fall, and I was like, I didn't realize. And so during our both of our exit meetings with Coach Finwood, um, we both asked him why, if there was a reason that me and Vinny didn't face each other, and he was like, Oh no, like I didn't realize, like. He's like, I'll make sure you guys face each other in the in the spring. So we got back and first scrimmage, me and Vinny were on opposite teams. And that was kind of like like he came up to the plate and I was on the mound and there was like fireworks. I think that's the best part about inner squads is when like cert- it could be guys that don't like each other. It could be guys that like each other a lot. There's always that little bit of uh incentive there to make sure that yeah. you do well. Um yeah. Like Morgan McGuire versus Will Morgan. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Morgan punched him out three times, and one day his parents came down to watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a tough, an absolute tough bid right there. John, I don't know if you know what this segment is called. We play balls and strikes. Do you know what that is? I do not. So Alex and I are going to fire off questions at you in opposite yeah. order, kind of. If you like the question, you call the strike, you answer the question, that person asks you the question again. If you don't like the question, you call it a ball. If you don't want to answer it, don't answer it. You still can. And then if you call a ball, the next person will ask a question. The first person to pitch a strikeout wins. So that's essentially how the game goes. Did you guys um, come up with this after Alex asked that completely horrible question? Yes. Yes, we did. John, it wasn't a bad question. <laughs> Alex, why don't you go ahead and go? You can go ahead and start us off today. No, no, you can go first today. Oh, you want me to go first? All right. Yeah. I will. Let me get I'm a little way. nervous about what questions he might ask after the last <laughs> segment. Um, <clears throat> if you could wake up tomorrow having gained one quality or ability, John, what would it be? Uh, strike. And I answer the question, John. Th- throw 100 miles an hour. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Oh, and one for me. If a crystal ball could tell you the truth about yourself, your life, the future, anything else, would you want to know what that what that future holds? No. Okay, you're missing the point of the game, John. The first thing oh. you say is strike the ball. Uh, ball. Okay. All right. Um, what is your <laughs> – Vinny's going to hate me for this question – now, I love how Vinny has the questions on his phone, like the questions he's going to ask you. Like, I don't prepare any questions. So, like, I have nothing in front of me. I have nothing. So, this is going to be completely off the cuff. But what would you say your spirit animal is? Hmm. Spirit animal. <sighs> is this a uh, striker ball? You, you decide. <laughs> ball. <laughs> oh, sorry, Alex. <laughs> are, are you gonna? Do you have one or no? I don't know. Go with a uh, a lion. When you make a telephone call, John, do you rehearse what you're going to say? Why or why not? Strike. Um. When you say rehearse, meaning like in my head like or out practice. loud? Like either way, either way, do you practice what you're going to say? Sometimes, yeah. 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 Have you ever done it out loud? Yes, I have. I like uh, that. In, I like in that. the car, in the car, I do that. 
Yeah. Speaking of the I car, are you singing in the car? Are you a big singer in the car? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, huge. Do you prefer the shower or the car, acoustics-wise? Car. Because in the shower, people can hear me. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> Nobody can hear me in my, in my car. Unless other people are in the car with you. Sure. Um, do you have a hunch? Oh, it's one and two. Alex likes this question. It depends on the guest. Oh, God. Like <laughs> do you have a secret hunch of how you're going to die? A secret hunch of how you're going to die? We asked the hard-hitting questions here, John. That is a very hard-hitting question. But, John, that's not a strike question. Hey, you're, you're not the umpire. There we I'm going to give you a ball there. Okay. Do you want to answer? Do I want to answer still? Yeah, do you want to answer or no? Um, no, I don't. I don't hey, have a hunch. We're going to get somebody. We're going to get somebody on here that <laughs> has a secret hunch how they're going to die and it's going to blow them up. <laughs> Maybe that's how. Maybe that's their uh, secret way. Yeah, Shoot. Uh, all right. <laughs> Where would be your dream vacation spot? Be. Ooh, I've always wanted to go to Europe. Um, we we always wanted to go there as a family when we were younger, but we never got around to it. So, John, Europe's a pretty big place. Um, do you specifically have anywhere that you'd like to go? I, I would want to go, like, multiple places, like, bounce around a little bit. Like, like where? Get specific. Like Italy, on. Italy, France. Um, Thank you. <laughs> just Spain. Spain. <laughs> Spain. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think sure. it would be really cool to see, the, see all those places up over there. <laughs> Strike a ball, John. Let's go. Strike. Okay. All right. I think Alex actually hates it when people call strikes because he doesn't know what the next question is going. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. And it's like scary sometimes because like I can't ask the one I want to ask because Vinny already called me out for it. So, and that's usually a strike. Oh, hey, John, what's one piece of memorabilia that you wish you have that you don't have? That, that's <laughs> one of his famous questions. All right. No, that's not – I'm trying to think here. All right. So how many pillows do you need to have to sleep at night? Strike. A lot. Hmm. Usually about two for my head, one under my arm, and then sometimes I'll put one in between my legs. The guy sleeps with a pillow underneath his legs. It's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. I guess it's yeah. some sleep thing. He Helps my back. And he has I, one in I do two. cuddle with a pillow, yes. Very comfortable. And every single morning I wake up, my pillow's on my floor. <laughs> John is one of the loudest snorers of all time. <laughs> and that's coming from a snorer. I I'm tweet. also a very deep sleeper. Vinny used to come in and wake me up because my alarm, yep. I wouldn't wake up to my phone. I wake up for class, which is why you had to go to extra study halls. So we, we, we shared a suite, so there was a bathroom in between that connected. And sometimes like one of the doors or both doors would be closed. And my alarm would be going off right next to me, and he would hear it from his room and come in because I wasn't waking up. Yeah. It's terrible. All right, Alex. One and two count, I believe. All right. One, two. I'm going for John's new knuckleball pitch here. Um, <laughs> what would be your biggest pet peeve? You said you live with Vinny. So what would be the biggest pet peeve that Vinny would do when he used to live together? Strike. Oh. <laughs> Vinny is a slob. I went again. <laughs> Vinny is very messy. <laughs> no, there's just no need for that kind of stuff right now. I mean, like, specifically in what way, John? Um, a lot of ways. <laughs> just stuff all over the place. I will say Vinny was a great sweet mate. Not roommate, technically. Basically roommates, but Thank you. we used to play uh, MLB The Show just about every night. We would play – we would draft teams and play a seven-game series in the playoffs, and I never beat him. The Not closest well. he got was the first time we ever played. We'd do seven-game series, and he went I, up I was up 3-1 and blew it. He came back to win 4-3. Yeah, and, and that he, was around the time of the world where – Three one jokes were the rage because yeah, the Warriors the, had just lost to the Cavaliers in the, mm -hmm. when they were up three one. 
So I had taped a sheet of paper that said, you lost in a, and you lost the series and you had a 3-1 lead. And I hung it over his bed. So at night, he just had to see that every single night. So he just, yep. that's my favorite part about college was those, <laughs> those stupid things that we would do, like just the yeah. best go all the time. I came back from class one day or something. There's just a big poster board piece of paper above my bed that said John blew a three one lead. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? But <laughs> good question. All right, so I, I went again. Congratulations, which, Alex. I mean, I, I'm just on a really great win streak right now and Vinny's just he's getting uh flustered over there. Doesn't know what to do with him, so not flustered at all. I don't know where that came from. I don't think I could be any less flustered at this current moment. Estoy en Tumente. Yeah, Estoy en Tumente, big time. Big time Estoy en Tumente. Um, so, John, we have two – we have three questions for the show, for the brand that we ask. Do you prefer drinking out of glass or plastic cups, John? Oh, I would say glass. It's a good answer. It's a good answer. Second question. What is the best, not the most important, whatever, what is the best position in baseball? Uh, now, I'm not going to say first base because I know that's what you're looking for. That's just out of spite, which means I know that first base. <laughs> um, I would say catcher because the catcher kind of – the catcher is controlling the game. Like, if you got a good catcher – that knows how to call a game well, and they're really the ones that are, like, managing the game besides the coaches. Like, they're the, the player coach, I guess, so to speak. You heard it um, here first, first, ladies and gentlemen. John Wilson, left-handed pitcher, wants to be a catcher. That's right. I was a catcher uh, once upon a time. I still have my left-handed catcher glove from Little League. Yeah, well, you, that's, that's a fact. I know that for a fact because I've used that before. That's right. And Vinny threw, used to throw bullpens to me. During a rain delay against FIU. Yeah, little known went to the bullpen. I did commit to school as a pitcher first and then a hitter second. That never materialized. But, you know, <laughs> to each their own, I guess. But 82 with some heavy sink. Damn right. So, John, 30-second elevator pitch. Tell us where everybody can follow you on your socials. What do you bring to the timeline? Why should they follow you? Well, I don't really tweet much. Um, I just kind of go on Twitter and – look at stuff and laugh and then close it out. Um, but my Twitter account is Johnny Wilson 32. And then my Instagram is Johnny Wilson 23. So you can follow me there if you so wish. Yeah. I mean, that's just, that must've gotten the people going right there. Everybody go follow <laughs> on after that exciting <laughs> intro to the social media. John, thank you for taking the time out of your day to come on the show. We really appreciate it. I hope you had a good time. I had a blast. Thanks. Thank you guys for having me. Well, that was a fun interview, don't you think, Alex? You, we talked about how much fun we had, but now that everybody just heard it, I mean, how much fun did you really have? You know, I'm trying to think of like another word. It was a tremendous, a lot of enthusiasm. And honestly, I, I was surprised by the hate uh, that he gave you when I asked him, what was it like? living with you and his biggest pet peeve well you know what's funny is since you know i'm a host on the show and not a guest on the show nobody asked me what my biggest pet peeve about john is as a rumor. Oh. well so, what's your biggest pet peeve about john he has the loudest breathing technique of anybody i've ever been around in my life sometimes he'll send me snapchat videos or something and it's he's trying to show me something and it's just him breathing that's all i can hear I mean, it's just unbelievably loud. And, you know, that's the knock that I have on John. So that's it. That's that's my biggest pet peeve with him. And he wants to act like I'm a slob. Come on. Come on. I've got four people in my back pocket right now that'll that'll tell how slobby John is. So, you know, he wants to come on the show and just slander me. That's fine. That's fine. I'll get him back one day. I don't know what to say to that, but... But no, I mean, this was a good interview. And, um, oh, you know what? I just realized, Vinny, we never really talked about who we're putting out on Thursday. Yeah, we don't know. 
who knows? It'll be a surprise for everybody. So if you're at this point in the show and you're waiting for who we're going to introduce on Thursday, <laughs> we don't even know. So I guess we'll, we'll say it's a surprise interview. Yeah, yeah. Big time breaking news. Oh, surprise interview. Got some noise happening on my TV over there. I've gotten into the game Assassin's Creed lately. That's what I've been grinding on. That and a, and a new game called Planet Coaster, which is basically Roller Coaster Tycoon, but for the PlayStation. Talk about grinding. That's just what I've been doing this weekend. Well, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Well, if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button. You're watching this on YouTube and you want to see some bear. There he is. Some bear. Look at that. He's got his lick mat, which is right here. Put some peanut butter on this. Apparently, it calms him down, but he loves the thing. And I opened up the windows in, in the room, so he's the watchdog. He just pays attention to whatever happened in the neighborhood. Good job, Bear. Good job. Yeah, good work, Bear. But anyways, thank you all for listening and watching this. And stay tuned for the surprise guest. On Get Thursday. excited for the surprise guest on Thursday morning. All right. Have a great rest of your Monday, everyone.